Haven't you read the paper? No, and I don't plan to. No, oh, you should. It's a good read to me. Let's see what the big news is. Oh, the superstorm. Widespread devastation. Power outages, fires. We've experienced seven aftershocks since yesterday's earthquake. Oh, make that eight. But don't worry, it's not the big one, yet. Okay, we need to talk. This isn't working. What isn't working? My relationship with you. One drop of rain and I I'm terrified. The wind blows and I I'm paralyzed with panic. I'm really good at that. A little bit of lightning and thunder, and I worry that my house is going to be destroyed in a storm. Well, you should be worried. I could lose everything. You will. What would happen to me? The worst. Perhaps I could lose my life. It's inevitable. Oh, nine. Those aftershocks are definitely getting stronger, don't you think? Okay. I had hoped that you wouldn't show up here today. But I was prepared if part teaching series that explores the question, what are you afraid of? Facing down your fears with faith. Believe it or not, disasters reveal at least four rock solid truths about God and even more about how we should respond to him. So stay tuned for all of this and more on today's edition of Turning Point. Every year, the news brings us yet another reminder that the natural forces governing this planet are troubled and unstable. Yes, nature is gorgeous and inspiring, but it's also monstrous and inhuman. In 2004, it was the Indian Ocean tsunami that killed 230,000 people. In 2005, we encountered Hurricane Katrina. And who can forget 2010? the earthquake in Haiti that cost another 220,000 people their lives. The tsunami in Japan, at least 15,000. Natural calamities rage in our world, costing us countless billions of dollars and more significantly hundreds of thousands of lives. We are all familiar with these events. But natural disaster raises many questions. Questions about the nature of our security, about our fear of the uncontrollable, and especially about the character of God. These questions need answers. But I'd like to open our discussion today by telling you about a biblical character who experienced two natural disasters in the space of 24 hours and his name, of course, is Job. The first few verses of the book of Job tell us about the man. Tell us about, first of all, his faith. The scripture says that he was a man who was blameless and upright and feared God and shunned evil. He's also distinguished as a man of great fortune. The Bible tells us that he had possessions, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, a very large household, and the Bible says that this man was the greatest of all the people in the East. Job was also a family man. The first chapter of Job tells us that he raised sons and daughters who were close-knit. They held incredible birthday parties every year, and the Bible tells us that every time they had a birthday party, Job would offer a sacrifice to God on behalf of his children. Oh, yes, Job was a man who had great faith and fortune, and he was also a great family man. It began during one of those birthday feasts that I talked to you about, with the sons and daughters all gathered together, laughing and enjoying each other's company. A messenger comes to the family home and approaches Job with disturbing news. Sabaean raiders have descended upon the estate, hijacked Job's cattle, killed all of his servants, and this messenger is the only one left alive so that he could come and tell Job what had happened. 
Yet even before he has finished with his account, before Job has taken it all in, the door opens and another messenger stands there. He is pale, his eyes are wide as he whispers, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants. And a third messenger brings news that the Chaldeans have raided and stolen the camels, killing the servants, and yes, only one is left to come with the bad news. While Job is trying to make sense out of this and form some sort of recovery plan, the last shoe drops. In verse 18 of the first chapter of Job, we read, while he was still speaking, another also came and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their older brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness. Does that sound familiar? A great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Can you imagine taking in such news in the course of one day? He was devoted to his children. He was constantly bringing them before God. But for all of his intercession, they have died in one fell blow. He faces ten fresh graves and an aching silence from heaven. Why, God? Why? And there is no answer. Since Bible scholars believe that Job is the oldest book in the Bible, we now know that the problem of natural calamities has been with us for as long as man has walked upon the earth. The Bible doesn't gloss over the tougher questions in life. It doesn't leave out the difficult stories. We're invited to stand with Job in the cemetery, looking down at the ashes of his dreams, and along with him to ask God why. The first question that this story and all natural disasters provoke is this. What do these recurring disasters say about God? Natural disasters and the reality of God. Let me say to you this morning, my friends, that if you came thinking that I was going to answer all your questions about disasters and why they happen, I cannot do that, nor can any other person do that, because that would involve looking into the very heart of God and knowing what God knows, and I cannot know that. But just because I cannot know everything does not mean I shouldn't take the things I can know and use them to help me comprehend, at least in some way, why these things happen and how we should respond. So let me tell you some things about God and disasters. First of all, God cannot be divorced from disasters. Some people say that the way you handle the questions of disasters and calamities in the world is just to say God didn't have anything to do with it. This explanation goes something like this. God created the world, but he's not involved in the operation of the world. If you've ever studied theology, you know that this is the doctrine of deism. Deism believes that we have a creator God and that we have a God who will judge us someday. But the interval between creation and judgment, God is silent and inactive and has nothing to do with anything that's happening in the world. He is an absentee God. When I was finished with my deal with cancer now almost 20 years ago, uh, my oncologist asked if I would be a part of a debate with a rabbi who had the same disease I had. I'll never forget that. And we each got to get up and talk about our cancer and our faith. He wanted to go first, and so he did. And he got up and he said something like this. People ask me all the time, do I pray to God about my illness? And he said, I tell them no. Since I know God had nothing whatsoever to do with my being sick, why should I expect that he would ever have anything to do with my getting well? I don't pray to a God like that because my God has nothing to do with going on on this earth. Then I got up and told everybody how good God had been to me and how he'd healed me. All I remember at the end of the event was I was standing there with Donna and there was a whole line of people waiting to talk to me and out of the corner of my eye I looked over and he was over there all by himself. <laughs> because nobody wants to talk to somebody who doesn't believe God's involved in the world today. What would be the purpose of that? 
Another way we extricate God from responsibility for disasters is to blame all of them on Satan. Does Satan have something to do with evil in the world? Absolutely. But we know from our study of Job that Satan cannot do anything without God's permission. And if Satan has to get permission from God to do what he does, then God is still in control and he reigns in the affairs of men. The Bible teaches that God is sovereign, that he reigns in the nice moments and in the moments that aren't so nice. Let's look at some of the reasons why disaster can exist in a world that God controls. First of all, God employs the elements of nature in the operation of the world. God didn't just create the world and then go off and leave it to run by itself. The Bible teaches us that the God we serve is a hands-on God who's involved in every detail of life. In fact, I want to read to you a passage from the book of Job where Job describes God's involvement with the issues of the world. Here it is, and I'll put it up on the screen, but I'll read it to you. For God says to the snow, fall on the earth. (laughs) Likewise to the gentle rain and the heavy rain of his strength. By the breath of God, ice is given, and the broad waters are frozen. Also with moisture, he saturates the thick clouds. He scatters his bright clouds, and they swirl about, being turned by his guidance, that they may do whatever he commands them on the face of the whole earth. God does that. God's involved in the details of every day, in the weather, in the natural things. We do right to pray to God over those issues. But not only does God employ the elements of nature in the operation of the world, we all know from our study of the Bible that sometimes he employs the elements of nature in his opposition to evil. I mean, we're hardly out of the first few chapters of the book of Genesis when we are introduced to a flood that God sent upon a sin-blackened world, sparing only Noah and his righteous family. God sent fire to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of their wickedness, and he sent a fierce storm to get Jonah's attention and bring him to repentance so he could go to Nineveh and preach the gospel. Men and women, I don't know all the answers to this, but I want to tell you, when we distance God from responsibility for the things that go on in our world, we are claiming more than we know. For listen, if God is not in control of the world's disasters, then how can we depend on him to be in control of our lives and our future? Either he is involved in all of the world's operation, or he is not involved in any of the world's operation. God cannot be divorced from disasters. Number two, God cannot be discredited by disasters. One thing we often overlook when we're reasoning about God and things that we don't understand is that the massive deaths that were caused by disaster cannot discredit God any more than a single death can discredit him. We know who brought death into the world, and it wasn't God. And we must remember that every one of the people who died in the Haiti earthquake would eventually have died anyway. And the fact that they died simultaneously is really no more tragic than if their death had been spread out over the next several decades. It's just that the sudden and unexpected simultaneous deaths shock us more. Death is in our world because the devil is the prince of death and one of these days he will be gone but right now he's still at work is he not god cannot be divorced from disaster he cannot be discredited by disaster notice this one he cannot be defined by disaster listen carefully in the aftermath of every disaster we often hear something like this well i could never believe in a god who would allow such awful things to happen to his creatures And those who define God solely by the evil he allows overlook the flip side of their complaint. Yes, there's evil in the world, but there's also an enormous amount of good. If God is not good as they claim, how do they account for all of the good we experience? Is it fair to judge him for the evil and not credit him with the good? Number four, God cannot be defeated by his disasters. When disasters happen, we are sometimes tempted to think like this, oops, God lost it, slipped out of his hands. He no longer is in control. 
God tried to do this thing and it didn't work. Now, I mean, you, you don't have to go very far to realize that can't be true because God doesn't have oops in his vocabulary. The Bible says that when things happen in our lives and we don't know what's going on and we can't figure it out and we're looking around thinking, what was that? God is working. We don't know what he's doing. We may not find out in this life, but you can be, be sure of it. He is working. Now, let me turn the page as we come uh, around the circle here. We've talked about disasters and the responsibilities of God. Now I want to talk about natural disasters and the responsibilities of man. In the midst of pain and grief, how should we respond? What does a disaster say to me? What does it say to you? When we see these things happening around our world, what do these disasters say? Well, we can pick up some clues from the scripture if we look carefully. First thing that disasters should do is teach us to repent of our sin. When you read about people losing their lives in fires and floods and hurricanes and tornadoes and, and tsunamis, do you ever wonder when you hear about them if they were prepared to meet their God? Does the question cause you ever to examine your own readiness? I mean, God uses disasters and tragedies to accomplish his perfect will in us and through us, and sometimes he uses tragedies to bring us to himself in the first place. So disasters teach us to repent of our sin, and they also teach us to reflect on God's goodness. You say, how can a disaster help you reflect on God's goodness? Hang with me here. When I watch reports of the natural disasters as they are instantaneously delivered to us by the media, my first thoughts are the many lives lost and the many families torn apart. But I have also found myself experiencing a sense of gratitude that my family and people I know were not touched by these events. And I have to tell you, sometimes I feel guilty about that. But I have come to understand that it is proper to be grateful that I have been saved even while I mourn for those who have been lost. If we wait until there are no losses before we are grateful to God for what he does for us, we will never be grateful one minute in our lives. God's blessings abound, my friends, and they are the norm. And it's proper to be grateful for them at all times, regardless of what the circumstances might be. Number three, disasters teach us to respond to the hurting. Listen carefully. When disasters happen, we should not be so concerned about the answers as to why. We should be asking God, how can we help? Surely, one of the things that should happen when disaster happens is we should reach out to the hurting. If the body of Christ doesn't do that, then pray tell who will. <laughs> Number four, Disasters teach us to remember God's promise. God has given us a spectacular, all-encompassing promise that provides the ultimate cure for our fear of disaster. I'm going to read it to you and then make a few comments about it. Revelation 21, 3 and 4. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people God himself will be with them and be their God, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Disasters remind us that God never intended for this world to be our final home. In fact, these disasters put within us a hunger and a longing for a place where there are no disasters, where there is no death, where pain and suffering and crying is a matter of history, not a present experience. Disasters teach us to remember God's promise. And finally, disasters teach us to rely on God's presence and his power. We begin this message by telling the story of Job Job got through that. It was, a, you know, if you read the book, it's a long, arduous process. But along the way, Job has his moments of strength and power. Along the way, Job can cry out in victory like he does in Job 13, 15. 
Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. Later on in the 19th chapter of Job, we hear him speaking these words, I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth, and after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. How many of you know that often when you go through difficult times and times of suffering and pressure, you have a view of God you could never have had before? He draws close to you. You don't just know about him, now you know him. He becomes your present helper in the midst. How are you doing? Fine. I'm, I'm fine. Why, why wouldn't I be fine? Just checking, just checking. How long has it been? We've been up here for six hours and 35 minutes. I know. So what? No cell phone connection? No internet connection. No contact whatsoever with anything in the outside world. Totally disconnected from everything and everyone. I'm good. Any bars yet? I'm dying to check. No reception. But I told you guys, I'm, I'm not going to be afraid. You say that every time we go camping. Right about now, you start panicking. Freaking out. You get all afraid and... I'm not afraid. Well, then maybe me and Justin should just leave you in this tent all alone. Ooh, alone? You hate to be alone. <sighs> Why are you guys doing this to me? We planned this camping trip with the sole purpose for you to confront your fear of being alone. Look at me. I I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I'm not afraid. Observe. Not even a tremble. Hello, Tyler. <laughs> okay, he's here. Who, who's here? My, my fear, it just showed up and he's doing that scary flashlight thing. What's the scary flashlight thing? You know, where you hold the flashlight under the chin and it makes your face look crazy evil. Like this? Yes, like, like that. Okay, well, you, you should tell your fear to stop it. Okay, um, fear, uh, my, my friends told me to tell you to stop it. But I don't want to. Fear says he doesn't want to. Tyler, remember what we discussed. Okay, um, Fear, cut it out. Whatever. <laughs> fear turned off the flashlight. Well, tell Fear thank you. I don't be polite, get on with it. Right, All right, right. Okay. Yeah, let me have it. Huh? <sighs> what? Fear is literally right behind you guys. Uh, this uh, is your fear, not ours. Yeah. You know, Tyler, sitting in this tent, you are totally disconnected from everyone in the world. I know. It's not fun being alone. I believe you'll be alone for the rest of your life. What's fear saying? He's telling me that I'm going to be alone for the rest of my life. I promise. Really? You think so? Tyler, you gotta get a hold of yourself. Tell Fear what you came here to say. Right. All right, okay. Fear, I have something for you. Really? It's a map. What is it, a treasure map? Hiking map? Where does this map lead? Out of my life. Excuse me? I'm putting you on notice that I will no longer be afraid of being alone. Yes, you will. No. I, I won't. Look, pal, I'm never alone. God is always with me. Face it down. And I'm telling you right now to get out of my mind, my life, this tent, and allow me to depend on God, who will never abandon me. So, is this how you really feel? Yes. That's how I really feel. This change your mind? <sighs> Sorry. Oh. He, he's gone. I, I should have done this a long time ago. Facing your fear with God's help works. Congratulations. Ooh. Really? I, I just experienced <laughs> victory and you guys are doing this. It's he's coming right. back. Not he's <laughs> really? Coming. I'm not
disconnection, the fear of being alone. From our teaching series, What Are You Afraid Of? Facing Down Your Fears with Faith. And it's all next, right here on Turning Point. Actress Anne Hathaway confessed that loneliness is my least favorite thing about life. The thing that I'm most worried about is just being alone without anybody to care for or someone who will care for me. And Josh Whedon, who's the director of The Avengers, says that loneliness is about the scariest thing in the whole world. Disconnectedness is the only way to describe a world where most people live in impersonal cities or suburbs where the internet replaces face-to-face -face conversation where the average job lasts only two years where people go from marriage to marriage and from state to state as we read our bibles we discover that this connection is the first thing in the bible that god said this is not good isn't that interesting in Genesis 2.18, the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper comparable to him. The first man who ever lived on planet Earth suffered the pain of being alone. And the Bible tells us the stories of many others along the way. I think of Noah, who preached for 120 years, and not one person was converted to the gospel. He and his family alone were saved through the flood. I think of Hagar, who got into domestic difficulty and ended up in the desert. And if you ever read that story, that's about the loneliest story you could ever read. She's all by herself. I think of Abraham trudging up the mountain with Isaac, knowing that God has called him to sacrifice his own son, and he doesn't understand it. Can you imagine the loneliness in his heart? And in what I believe is the loneliest verse of the Bible, Psalm 142 and verse 4, David says, Look on my right hand and see, for there is no one who acknowledges me. Refuge has failed me. No one cares for my soul. The Bible doesn't try to ignore the problem of being alone. If God recognized it right out of the beginning of the book of Genesis, and we see it illustrated throughout the Old Testament, we should not be surprised to discover it both in the New Testament and then also in our own lives. If I had to choose the person who illustrates what it means to be disconnected more than anyone else in the Bible, it would be the Apostle Paul. That might surprise you because as you read Paul's letters and as you learn about him in the Bible, you discover that Paul was a real people person. I'm always amazed that Paul carried on such a vigorous life and such an incredible schedule, and yet he knew so many people by name. And so we know that Paul is not just a recluse. He's not just somebody who doesn't like people, and therefore he experiences loneliness. No, he was a very relational person. But when we meet him in the fourth chapter, we meet a lonely man. And we begin by understanding something of the disconnection of isolation. Paul has been charged with sedition. He's come before Caesar and he's been sentenced to prison. It was not his first time to be in prison. As you know, Paul had a reputation of going into a city and preaching in the synagogue. And either, if you wanted to find Paul, he would either be in the synagogue or in prison. He was in one of two places because he always was in trouble. But he's in prison now. And here are his words from the fourth chapter of 2 Timothy, describing the fact to Timothy that he knows his time is limited, that he is just about at the end of his journey. He writes in verse 6, the time of my departure is at hand. Paul knew that he was about to die, and as he waited for his execution, he was disconnected and alone. He was, as we learn uh, from history, incarcerated in the Mamertine prison in Rome. And he was isolated and alone. This man who loved people, 
who knew so many of them by name, spending his last days all alone. And he illustrates the disconnection that we have in our culture today. We live in a lonely world. Did you know that? Here's Paul isolated in this prison. But if you read the record here in the fourth chapter, you will discover even more. For he's not just experiencing the disconnection of isolation, but he's also experiencing a different kind of aloneness, a different kind of being disconnected, which I have preferred to call the disconnection of infidelity. If you read through the last verses of 2 Timothy 4, it's like reading a litany of desertion and departure. And when you come to the 10th verse of the 4th chapter of 2 Timothy, you are introduced to a man by the name of Demas. For Demas has forsaken me, said Paul, having loved this present world and has departed for Thessalonica. Now we are often tempted to demonize Demas, but he did not necessarily depart from his faith. He departed from Paul. And apparently when Paul was put into prison, Demas, who had been one of his close associates, didn't want any part of this kind of intensity in his Christian experience. He wanted a more convenient and comfortable and less threatening kind of Christianity. And so he left Paul and he went to a safer place in Thessalonica. But his departure was very painful for the apostle. Apparently Paul had discipled Demas, perhaps spent hours building into his life, thought he was a trusted friend and disciple who would stay with him through thick and thin. But when the pressure was on, Demas went for the high country. And Paul said he forsook him. And Demas wasn't the only one. For if you look at the 16th verse of the fourth chapter, you continue to build the case for Paul's loneliness. He said, at my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. We experience sometimes the disconnection of isolation. Some of you know what Paul was going through. Somebody you trusted, somebody you believed in, somebody you cared about, somebody in whose life you have spent hours building, walks away and leaves you with no explanation. Isn't it true that sometimes the people we feel like we're closest to can end up hurting us the worst? And then Paul said there was one more thing that added to his absolute total disconnectedness in prison. And that's what I've called the disconnection of interference. Notice verses 14 and 15 where we meet this guy named Alexander. Paul says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. Beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. Now, we don't know much about Alexander. We're not even really sure which Alexander this is. There are a number of them in the Bible. We do know he's a coppersmith. But the Bible says he did much harm to Paul. Actually, the sentence reads like this. He informed many evil things against me. And most scholars believe that what happened with Alexander was he turned to be a Judas against Paul. Just like Judas had to betray the Lord Jesus, Alexander gave Paul away to the authorities and made it necessary for them to come and get Paul, and that's why he was rearrested for the second time and put in prison. But Paul seems to be more concerned not about what Alexander did, but by what he was saying, apparently Alexander was not believing the truth and accepting the words of the gospel. And Paul describes him as being a very dangerous man who has interfered with the gospel. And he says to Timothy, don't get involved with him. He's not somebody you want to hang out with. Look back over this and you will see that here is a disappointed man. This is not the way you want Paul's life to end. This man who has given us the New Testament in many respects, so much of it. This man who was the great missionary evangelist who established churches all over Asia Minor. This man who many think was the greatest man who walked on this earth apart from the earthly walk of Jesus Christ. Is ending his life in a foul dungeon, bereft of friends, and being treated as an enemy by Alexander. So how do we help ourselves when we find ourselves in a similar situation, obviously 
not with the same outward circumstances, but with the same inward disconnectedness in our life. What clues can we figure out from this passage? And I'm pretty excited about this because it's interesting to me that this book we call our Bible is one of the most practical books you will ever read. And if you just read it carefully, you will find things there that just amaze you. Now, in this passage of Scripture, we have painted the picture of where Paul is. Now, let's notice what he did about his situation. And in doing this, we discover four or five things about being disconnected that we can transfer into our own lives. In verses 9, 11, and 21, we learn that Paul is putting out an alert. He is saying, we need companionship when we're alone. Listen to his words. Be diligent to come to me, Timothy. Come quickly. Get Mark and bring him with you. Verse 21, do you utmost to get here before winter. Paul cries out for his companions. He's unwilling to spend these last days all by himself with just Luke as his companion. And he says, Timothy, I want you to get here as quickly as you can. Bring Mark with you and try to get here before winter. The Bible is filled with reminders of the truth that people need people. So Paul reaches out, first of all, And he asks for companionship. And then notice, verse 13, he says, I need you to bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come. Not only do we need companionship, we need compassion. Isn't it true that when we are ministering to those who are alone, it's not just about being with them. It's about noticing what their needs are and trying to meet them. And here's Paul. Listen to me. Here's where he is. He's in this prison, this cold prison, And he knows he cannot survive this winter if he doesn't have some warm clothing. So he asks for his cloak. Whenever we're in a world that is filled with loneliness, all we have to do is look around and we see every illustration of it you can imagine. Somebody you know today is alone and they need some help. Maybe you need to take a pie to them or some cookies or take them to dinner or whatever But it's not just being with somebody, it's being with somebody and caring about that person when you're with them. Thirdly, in the same context, we read that we need courage. Notice verse 13, Paul says to Timothy, when you come, bring the books, especially the parchments, which were animal skin, precious vellum codices. And the difference between the two was probably that the books were made of papyrus And these roles could have included any number of things like Paul's Roman citizenship papers or correspondence. Some people think it was just extra writing space for Paul to continue his writing because you do know he wrote epistles from prison. That's why we have the prison epistles. (laughs) And the parchments were probably Paul's copies of the Old Testament scriptures and maybe some of the writings of Jesus. When Paul was isolated, he said, would you please bring me my books? If you are a book lover like I am, you get this. If I'm going to have to be alone, at least give me my books, and especially the book, the Bible. When I was uh, going through uh, my bout with cancer years ago, uh, some of you know I was preaching during most of the time I was in treatment. And if you ever have had that disease or been around somebody that does, it's kind of like background noise in your head. You can try to think about other things, but it's pretty hard to keep from thinking about that. And sometimes I would get to my desk and I knew I had to get a message ready for church and all I could think about was, did my scan go all right? Is something gonna be okay? And what, you know. And I would just have to get in my chair and say, by the grace of God, I'm gonna get over this hump. Some days I had to just take my pen and start writing out the scripture to prime the pump. But I want to tell you something, friends. When you get over the hurdle and you get engaged, you can lose yourself in the study of the Word of God. It's like an island of joy in the midst of the challenges. I can see Paul in the few hours of light that he had from the opening in his cell, pouring over the words of Jesus and the scriptures of the Old Testament, and in the midst of his dire circumstances, finding joy in the truth of God. And by the way, when you do that, 
if you do it seriously, you'll start bumping into scriptures that you have forgotten about. For instance, how's this one? Psalm 27:10. When my father and my mother have forsaken me, then the Lord will take care of me. Or Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, which is a quotation from the Old Testament, which Paul no doubt had. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. When we are disconnected, we need companionship. And we need compassion. And we need courage from the Word of God. But here is the, here's the pinnacle of what we need. We need Christ. And notice what Paul says in verses 17 and 18. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Paul said, yes, I've been deserted by all my friends. Demas has forsaken me. Alexander's against me. All these other people have left me. I'm here alone with Luke, but I want to tell you something. I'm not alone. When I stood before Caesar and everyone had gotten out of the territory, the Lord Jesus Christ was with me. Some people believe Jesus actually showed up personally and was standing there in the courtroom with Paul. But whether he was or not, he was there. And he will be there for us when we cry out to him in our moments of loneliness. Jesus himself experienced this very thing when he realized that his disciples had run out on him we read his words in John 16, 32. He says, And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. Here's what I want you to know, men and women today. However alone you may feel, you are never alone if you're a Christian. Almighty God is with you. His Spirit indwells you. And His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is with you every moment. You say, well, I, I'm not aware of it. Do you know how you can become aware of it? When you study the Word of God and you begin to hear the Word of God, you become aware of the presence of God in your life. That's how it works. Do you remember the comment we made at the beginning that the first thing God was not uh, pleased with was that man was alone. He said it is not good that man shall be alone and Adam and Eve were together as husband and wife and then they sinned and they were cut off from God and they were separated because of their sin and the disconnection of the Garden of Eden ultimately led to another more profound disconnection that took place when Jesus died on the cross and we hear him on the cross crying out my God my God why have you forsaken me? The purpose of the forsakenness of Jesus was so that you and I would not have to stay disconnected from God because we are sinners and we, are, and we have nothing to offer to God in ourselves. We are sentenced to death. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. That's disconnection. But God came here and sent his son Jesus to the cross and when Jesus went to the cross, he suffered our disconnection for us so that we could be connected with God forever. And because he died on the cross and paid the penalty for all of our sin, yours and mine, the sin of everyone in the world, and because he was the infinite son of God, his death was an infinite death, equal to the death for everyone. Now he comes to us and says, you are disconnected from the Father but I have come to build a bridge between. Hello, I am David Jeremiah. Thank you for joining me for this very special presentation of Forward. Today, we're going to talk about tomorrow and the tomorrow after that. When we seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness first, the future unfolds for us at the speed of grace. God has something special planned for you. So no matter where you find yourself today, your life is far from finished. In fact, it's just beginning. That was the Apostle Paul's attitude when he declared, I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race 
and receive the heavenly prize which God through Christ is calling me. That's always been my approach to life and I want it to be yours as well. The forward message is for young people who desperately need to know who to trust as they discover God's will for their life. It's for young parents and professionals who are stunned by the pressures of life. It's for those in midlife who need a fresh start. And it's for those of us who are older because sometimes we forget our richest moments with God are ahead of us. The forward message is for anyone experiencing a transition in life from someone who is unemployed and starting over to someone who is retiring from the workforce. It's for the person who's afraid to try something new. It's for the person who is hesitant to dream big and finish strong in life. And it's for someone who is ready to step out in faith. Today, I want to give you a glimpse of the message God put on my heart. I've written a book on moving forward in life, and it is also the basis of my teaching series on Turning Point Television and Radio this fall. In the next few moments, I will be joined by three very special guests who are here to take part in our forward discussion. Sheila Walsh, Levi Lesko, and Anthony Evans. So are you ready? Let's talk about how you can discover God's presence and your purpose in your tomorrow. It's time to move forward. It's time we rise above our circumstances, conquer our fears, face the future with faith, prevail over the past, aspire to accomplish greater things, reclaim our birthright, proclaim His power, and claim God's promises. God has more for us. It's not time to stop. It's time to move forward. If you want to rise from your rut, conquer your circumstances, face the future with fearlessness, define your dreams, muster up motivation, prevail over your past, aspire to accomplish more, do greater things, or simply live out your life as the best version God intended, then forward is for you. Recently, I sat down with a very good friend of mine, Sheila Walsh, and we discussed how to move forward to discover the purpose and presence of God in tomorrow. Sheila is a respected author, Bible teacher, and television host, and she's also my friend. Here is part of our conversation. I cannot think of a more timely message. Tell us about your new project, Forward. You know, forward is not a place where you are, it's a direction you go. Hmm. And everybody needs to move forward. Why do you think people are concentrate more on the rear view mirror than the windshield in front of them? That's a really good illustration, isn't it? Mm. The, the windshield's huge, the rear view mirror is small, and yet some people choose to live in their rear view mirror. I think a lot of people feel like they get stuck in the past. And I was wondering, how do you find that right balance between balancing the past, the present, and the future? Well, you know, that's kind of built around maybe the theme verse for the whole book where Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind, I press toward the mark for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And what Paul wasn't saying is, do away with my past. But what he was saying is, I'm not going to let the past control my present or my future. And when you stop and think about it, Paul had some awful things to forget. You know, he, he was the great persecutor of the church. He killed some people because of their faith. I know he imprisoned a lot of them. I know a lot of people that have bad things in their past and they can't get beyond it. Yeah. But Paul also had some good things. He was the Pharisee of Pharisee. He had his, his pedigree, which is in the Bible twice, is like none you'd ever read in your life. He was so well qualified and he had so much going for him. And Paul said, neither my failures nor my successes control my life. I don't let those things control me. I have a goal for the future and that's what drives me forward. What did you mean when you wrote, make the one thing the main thing? It's not easy to come up with one thing. Yeah. But when you realize what it is that God wants you to do, when you figure that out, then you spend the rest of your life trying to make sure that it keeps mm -hmm. its place as your priority. And it is attacked every single day. Yeah. 
But I think it's interesting that sometimes we don't see that that one thing for that time is the greatest ministry Absolutely. you could possibly have. Yes. You know, if you have one thing and it's the wrong thing, mm -hmm. it's really not a good picture. And a lot of people, they get off track. That's not God's will. Yeah. We, we know that for sure. Now, here's a question I never thought in my whole life I would ever ask you. What is the carrot principle? Well, the carrot principle is really interesting because I have a friend who used to be the number one carrot farmer in the world. Oh, he had a carrot farm up in Bakersfield, California. And at one time, they were growing and producing 38% of the carrots eaten in America. Wow. So one day I went up there to see this place and walk through it. And at the end of it, my friend took me in a, in a room and there was a big whiteboard there. And he went up and he drew a carrot on the whiteboard. He said, Jeremiah, he said, let me show you what I do with this carrot. And he began to draw a little line out from the carrot saying, I make carrot juice. I make those little carrots. There were 24 products that he got wow. from the carrot. And I remember asking him how much of the carrot do you end up wasting? He said, well, it's my purpose, none of it. I was so impressed with that. And I came home and we were having a staff meeting and I went to my whiteboard and I drew a Bible. I said, this is my carrot. Yeah. We study it, we print it, we reproduce it, we teach it, we televise it, we put it on social media. Mm -hmm. And we came up with more than 24 things that come from our carrot. That's what it means to get your one thing and yeah. let that one thing dominate your life and what you do. But there's great intentionality in that. I think that's what I loved about that chapter. It's not a casual thing. It's finding out what the thing is and then paying careful attention to every detail and how that could be multiplied. I found that chapter personally so helpful. I only have invented one word in my life. You invented I, a word? I invented a word. Wow. I don't think it existed. It may not <laughs> exist now, but it's my word. <laughs> You know, when you, when you do something that's important in the order in which you do it, you call it a priority. Yes. When you don't do something in the order that you don't do it, it's a posteriority. <laughs> and I have a list of posteriorities, and those wow. are the things I don't do in the order that I don't do them. <laughs> because if you don't have one of those, you just get w overwhelmed with yeah. life. We don't always think about, as believers, of taking a risk. We think of that maybe as, you know, dangerous, careless behavior. But in your experience as a pastor, why is that so important to be able to move out of a safe place or place of risk? Well, I suppose to be honest, Sheila, risk is just another more secular term for faith. Yeah. Living in the unknown beyond where you can see. Mm -hmm. And if you're not willing to risk as a believer, if you're not willing to walk by faith, mm -hmm. you can't go forward. Yeah. You're always going to be waiting for the next place where you feel secure and you will never go beyond your security blanket, and that's where a lot of Christians are. One of the questions I get asked often is, is it possible to know God's will and plan for your life? I actually do believe that it is. I believe you can know what God wants you to do. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a passivity that fills the hearts of a lot of people because they think, well, if this is what God wants me to do, he's going to do it, and I'll just be a participant. I actually hear people teach that. Wow. God has promised to do his part, but that doesn't mean we don't have a part to play too. Maybe that's at the heart of where some people get lost because they think ambition is not something that has a Christian value. You know, selfish ambition is wrong, but godly ambition is right. God expects us to be ambitious for the things he calls us to do and not just sit around and wait for something to happen, which is what a lot of people do. God wants us to strive forward and move toward the goal he set before us. Maybe you're asking, how do I move forward in life? In his book, Forward, Discovering God's Presence and Purpose in Your Tomorrow, Dr. Jeremiah answers with a biblical strategy to help you find and stay in the center of God's constant unfolding plan for you, no matter what circumstances or challenges have slowed your momentum. Forward is yours when you give a gift of any amount in support of this program. And in appreciation of your gift of $75 or more, Dr. Jeremiah will send you the Forward Set. Plus, with your book or set, Dr. Jeremiah will also send you his Move Forward Motivation Cards to help you keep the lessons of Forward front and center each day. God has more for you. It's not time to stop. It's time to move forward. Request the Forward Book or Set when you support Turning Point today. I want you to meet a friend of mine, a man who is a perfect example of someone God moved forward in life even when he could have stopped. 
Tom's story so impressed me, I put it in my new book. I think his story will inspire you as well and will challenge you to find an area of your life where God can still work mightily through you. When Tom could have looked backward incarcerated, Tom made it his mission to help them and their families during the holiday season. On the Saturday before Christmas, a huge party is hosted for the children of incarcerated parents. Our church hosts hundreds of families that would be forgotten were it not for this incredible ministry. For those behind bars, they are on the receiving end of what we like to call the Great Christmas Card Mail-Out. Last Christmas, hundreds of volunteers in San Diego, under the direction of Tom Heyer and his team, sent out over 15,000 Christmas cards to inmates. Today, thanks to Tom's leadership, the Shadow Mountain Prison Ministry is one of the largest church-sponsored prison ministries in America. And it all started in the life of one man who had just retired. Tom Heyer could have looked back at everything he had accomplished and chosen to be done, but instead, he saw a need and answered God's call. He was prepared to move forward, and God did just that, moved Tom forward. You know, moving forward isn't a challenge for only those past retirement age. It's also a call to greater life purpose and practice, no matter what your age, young, old, or any stage of life. I've invited someone to join me today who I believe understands and reaches the next generation better than anyone else I know. Levi Lesko is the founder and lead pastor of Fresh Life Church in Montana, Wyoming, Oregon, and Utah. He's the best-selling author of Through the Eyes of a Lion, Swipe Right, and I Declare War. Levi also travels the world speaking about Jesus. He and his wife, Jenny, have one son, Lennox, and four daughters, Olivia, Daisy, Clover, 